Hello, my friends. This is part three, and what I think is going to be a three-part series. This will probably be the last video in this series on the meaning of Rahu and Ketu. In this part three, we're going to look at charts. We're going to look at the research. We're going to see how we have developed this new understanding of what Rahu and Ketu do. And one of the key points about any interpretation of vibrational astrology is that in vibrational astrology, we understand everything in astrology, every planet, every zodiac sign, everything, every aspect, to have some positive intention. We know there's awful things in the world. Crime, disease, I mean, we don't have to go through the list of all the awful things and pain and agony that are going on in the world all the time. There are bad things, duh, we know that. But those bad things happen through misalignment, misexpression, inability to, to perfect the full potential. The astrology itself is not an as above, so below. It's not like a crystal ball that tells you what's going on in the world. It tells you an underlying, uh, underlying motivations and forces from a higher dimensional space. So I just want to make that clear because the Vedic view of uh, Rahu and Ketu it has all these positive and negative, uh, this is good, this is bad. And you even get a little bit of that, um, you know, with the evolutionary. But here, everything just, we're going to see what the purpose is and how things can go off. Um, and also, I want to mention that Rahu, in pursuing its, des its goal, its destination of bringing all of this unconscious material into expression, into a clear expression, it is like a river. It's taking this mass of stuff and channeling it and focusing it. And it does tend to bring things together. It synthesizes qualities, brings them together, and it brings people together. So Eberton is correct. That is another element of, of the nodes, that it's often where things, where you meet people that those unconscious and emotional connections coming together to help and move forward with that expression. And often it does bring in other people. So it's interesting. There's some truth to the Vedic, some truth to the evolutionary, and some truth to Ryan Old Everton's views of the notes. Now what I'm going to present to you started, these ideas that I'm going to present now in the example charts, it started with research by astrologer Clarissa Dolphin. Her research on the nodes where she looked at charts where there were many planets all bunched together with the node and what's going on in those charts. Um, so I just want to, you know, to credit her and, and note that. And then I've gone in, did a little more research confirming things and looking at it from yet another perspective. But the original findings by Corissa have held up through the years as we do more research, as we apply the ideas. Um, of course, ideas get refined and we see new aspects of things, but the basic principles found through her research are holding up. And I want to show you an example of one of her findings to illustrate how the nodes work, which is what Clarissa did is um, she not only uh, looked at the natal chart to see where the node is from, she looked at vibrational charts, also known as harmonic charts, to see where the node is extremely conspicuous. And one example is former President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, and we do have, by the way, AA data from him, data from a birth certificate or birth record. Um, in his nine vibration, the North Node stands out. Let's look at his nine vibration chart, and we'll understand how the nodes work. Now, the advantage to this kind of research is there's no selection bias, number one. We're not just randomly picking a chart that happened to work. Franklin Delano Roosevelt has one of the strongest uh, Rahu, the strongest Rahu you can imagine in any chart. He is, and strong defined by the most planets bunched up together with it. So this is one way of seeing what's going on. And what we see, by the way, this is his birth chart, if you want to look at that. Here's the nine vibration chart, also called, also called Navamsa chart in Vedic astrology, and there's Rahu at 4 Gemini, Jupiter's at 2 Gemini, Mars at 3 Gemini, Rahu at 4 Gemini, Mercury also at 4 Gemini, Uranus at 11 Gemini, all these planets 
all packed together with Rahu. The nine vibration is a vibration of community, of feeling a part of things, of connecting people together in a gentle, healing kind of way. And he has Rahu with Mercury, understanding, communicating. Mars doing something on a large scale. Uranus a little farther away, but still within orb of what we use in these charts, giving some um, uh, pioneering, inventive qualities to it, or freedom, emphasis, spontaneity. Spontaneity is probably the best word for Uranus. To this, and what does FDR do? I'll, I'll read from this slide um, what he does. In the summer of 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt, governor of New York, was nominated as the presidential candidate of the Democratic Party. In his acceptance speech, Roosevelt addressed the problems of the Depression by telling the American people that, quote, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. This quote has gone down in history. This is huge. And be, his uh, policies to improve the domestic situation in the economy of the United States got, what became called the New Deal. In the election that took place in the fall of 1934, Roosevelt won by a landslide. In, short term, in the short term, the New Deal programs helped to improve the lives of people suffering from the events of the Depression. In the long run, New Deal programs set a precedent for the federal government to play a key role in the economic and social affairs of the nation. So the whole idea of the government getting involved in a more active way, participating in people's lives to lift them up and have these social programs, this is largely due to Franklin D. Roosevelt, that did to develop it on a much larger scale. Very popular, it was very successful, and now you know there's a lot of debate about you know maybe these ideas going overboard. But the New Deal, the Nine Vibration, the People's President. Bam! Nine vibration mania. And what is the North Node doing there? Our understanding is it's bringing this torrent of energy. It's bringing this mass of emotion and feeling, channeling it into a focus that Mercury, Mars, we're going to engineer. We're going to do Jupiter. We're going to do it big. What are we going to do? We're going to make community. You count. Everybody counts. North Node bringing the wisdom of, Sag, of K2 in Sagittarius, the broader view. It's that broad view, that large perspective, that idea that life is about discovery. Life is about an adventure. Everyone needs to have a right to this adventure of life, the opportunity. And we're going to create a community with, this is the secret wisdom this is the wisdom of K2, that life is an adventure and we're going to make life an adventure. Not people working from early in the morning to late at night in factories with minimum wage, barely surviving like slaves, like, you know, like cogwheels and machinery. Or having no opportunity for higher education or higher pursuits. No, that's the wisdom He's not talking about directly. He's saying we're gonna build, we're gonna help you. That's what he's doing. We're gonna have, we're gonna have programs. We're gonna have work programs. We're gonna have you know loans. We're gonna have whatever it takes to build this community. Tremendous force. Tremendous support. He wins by a landslide. Where, where, oops. Where the North Node is is where you can win by a landslide. It brings a tremendous amount of a torrent of energy and support for it. So it is the goal, it is the way, and the hidden power is in K2, that this is what we should be doing. This is the platform. This is the highest priority. This is what it's all about. Go out and do it. And he did it. And he succeeded. And in the short term, as it says in the quote, it succeeded. Now, is it succeeding 50 years after his life and beyond, you know, his, his presidency? You can debate that. But the chart isn't so much about people implementing what you did in your life 
50 or 60 years later in a completely different context and whether it works or not. But did it work during his lifetime? Yes. Did it have a big impact? Did it move things forward? Yes. Okay, now, um, let's look at the next thing here. Um, so Clarissa did quite a bit of research on this, very exciting findings. She gave lectures about it and so on. What I decided to do was to do another little research project to compare the Vedic ideas, the evolutionary ideas, and the vibrational astrology ideas in some way. And I decided to use Saturn because Saturn creates the most trouble, according to most forms of astrology, not necessarily vibrational, but in evolutionary astrology, if you see Saturn involved with the nodes, you figure there's going to be some difficulty. And K2 um, is, you know, the, can be the source of problems. So I decided to look at the charts that have K2 conjunct Saturn with the smallest orb. I ran a research feature in the Series 4.0 software to find people with Saturn conjunct K2 with the smallest orb. And then I selected only people with AA data, only from birth certificate, that are not born on the quarter hour, not born on the hour, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or 45 minutes after the hour, because sometimes they're rounded off. So we don't always have that restriction, but in this research, I decided to be very conservative, make sure that these are timed charts and not rounded off. I mean, the time is given to the minute on the birth certificate, and some people are born on the quarter hour, quite a few, but I left those out. And I also left out the ones that don't have a lot of biographical information about them. Because the nodes can be hard to detect. Because we're talking about purpose and momentum. How do you measure this? So I wanted to have a lot of biography. So only about one in five or ten people met all these criteria. Um, and the top three that I found were George Archer, a professional golfer, Anthony Edwards, an actor, and Issa Rae, who is a writer, actress, and producer. They all have Saturn conjunct the south node with a very, very small orb, the smallest orb of anybody in the database. So, will the evolutionary astrology interpretation work? That there are, you might say, ancestral limitations to overcome with that Saturn K2. You're supposed to leave K2. Saturn created some limitations there. Does that... Can we tell? Does that seem to make sense? Or does the Vedic interpretation make sense? That there's a deep, reclusive, high spirituality, perhaps loneliness. Some kind of Saturn K2, like some kind of tendency to want to go off in, in the Himalayan mountains kind of feeling, you know, like in some uh, retreat away from the world. Um, do they, are they selective and limited in their friends? That might be something close to what Everton would say. Or are they infusing their life path with a sincerity, depth, and long-range view of what is really important? That would be the vibrational astrology interpretation. So if in their life work, if in the basic things they do, there's a clear theme, what we're looking for is a clear theme. They have this with a small orb. Because these things are so vague, so hard to pin down, it's easy to make sense of them. And I think that's one reason why you can have groups of astrologers disagree with each other so much, because there's so many ways to look at it, and so many ways it can manifest. So I'm looking for something clear and sharp and evident in their lives, having to do with these themes. Okay, George Archer. He was a golfer. He won 13 PGA events. That's a major golf t tournaments. Were there ancestral limitations to overcome? Oh, boy, let's look at his chart, by the way. So here's George Archer. There he is, born October 1st, 1939, at 11.05 p.m. in San Francisco. And there's K2, conjunct Saturn with a one-minute orb. So is it evident in his life in some way? And you can interpret the whole chart. If you want to look at the dispositor as Mars and it's in Aquarius, whatever you want to do, you can do. This kind of research puts no limitations on us. But I framed my research just with those questions and just with that emphasis 
So um, let's see what we come up with. I don't want that. I want um, this. Are there ancestral limitations to overcome? Well, he was illiterate. He couldn't read. Um, and it was kept a secret. Saturn, secret. He had a, he had a secret problem. So, yes, there was this limitation, a very important limitation. Um, so, but why is it specifically illiteracy? Uh, you know, is there something in the Mars, is in Aquarius ruling that? You can make your arguments. I mean, a lot of us have some limitation in some way. So you can judge for yourself. Um, does it fit or not? I would say if it fits... It fits, but it's pretty vague. It didn't pinpoint it very clearly. Is there a deep reclusive high spirituality, perhaps loneliness, according to Vedic? Uh, and if you're a Vedic astrologer, you could chime in with, with a more purely Vedic interpretation and how you do see it in the chart. That would be fine. Um, but just looking at it in this sense, not in any obvious way, um, he was a bit shy. He was loved by everyone. Um... So, I don't know, not, not in any obvious way that we could find. Is he selective and, and limited in his friends, as Everton might say? Yes, he was shy. He was kind of quiet. He had to be because of illiter his illiteracy. He was trying to hide this. I mean, there were times where he got awards and he was asked to say things and, you know, so sign autographs, which he couldn't do very well or he couldn't do at all. He was also six feet, six inches tall, which made him stand out. And I think, um, you know, I think the combination of illiteracy or whatever else, you know, he, he kind of um, was a very sincere person um, and not, not a show-off and didn't, wasn't extremely gregarious. So you could say, yes, Everton's right about that. Um, whether had, wh how, what he would be like if he wasn't illiterate and so on, I don't know. But yeah, it's true. So that is true. Now, does he infuse his life with sincerity, depth, and long-range view of what is really important? Let's look at the next slide. Well, here's what we know about George Archer. He had a very loving family. Uh, his wife, Donna, was very devoted to him. He was very devoted to her. He was a family man. He was a married man. And after he died, his wife, Donna, founded the George Archer Memorial Fund, which is dedicated to learning disabilities. So she struggled with him, trying to help him with these difficult situations. And then his daughter, his two daughters, one of them, Lynn, is a special education teacher. Here's a quote from a website about her. Um, daughter Lynn is a is a, she's a special education teacher. She says her father's life might have gone differently if he were growing up today. She says he would have been identified as being dyslexic. He would have had intervention, intervention that's very specific. Lynn says, I'm working with a student now who probably is just a reincarnation of my dad. The grasping for the letters, the trying to get the P and the B straight, it makes me feel connected to him, in fact. You can feel the love, the devotion, the understanding of his children, of his wife, um, he was sincere. He was a kind person throughout his life. He seemed to know what was important. He kept to the basics much more than others. He didn't let his, his fame and everything. He was just a simple person. Um, the importance of devotion, of his children, of his family, um, of doing things in a sincere and proper way. He... Uh, his sincerity, his humility, made him very much appreciated and loved. It, all of, it seems like everybody loved George Archer. His wife and children continue the legacy of focusing on what is most important. You know, a, a disability. That, and the sincerity and honesty and care and attention. I would say that, yes, his in life was infused with the sincerity, depth, and long-range view of what is really important. Now, what we found... It's just like when I gave the example in the second video in the series of my chart and my K2 and Libra in the seventh house. It's not obvious. It doesn't hit you over the head. The node doesn't hit you over the head with obvious, clear manifestations like aspects between planets. We see the greatest athletes 
Uh, I'm going to make a video about that, uh, another video showing the statistical significance and the clarity of this. The bipolar disorder, you know, wrote a book about it. You get behaviors, clear, crisp, sharp. With the nodes, we're still not getting the kind of more solid, measurable evidence that we are getting for aspects between planets, but we are getting overall support for the ideas. So we're not expect. here's the bottom line, we're not expecting Rahu and Ketu to be as conspicuous in the life. They're more like guides on meaning and purpose and much more difficult to measure than the interaction of planets. Fortunately, the interaction of planets is much easier to measure and we are developing very high confidence, a very solid, very, very, very high confidence, a strong evidence-based system. But with the nodes, it's slower going because it's not as sharp and crystal clear. So did George Archer in some clear, obvious, and conspicuous way, um, you know, uh, have Saturn opposition the the South Node? No. But was he essentially a Saturn South Node kind of person having an instinctive awareness of what really matters in life? Yes. I think everybody who knew him, according to what I've read, would say he was that kind of person. And so it's it's like that. It's like a temperament. Hard to measure, but it's there. Um, and again, fortunately, with, with planets, you can measure it and get, you know, sharper things. So this is our understanding of the nodes, that a lot of what's said in evolutionary astrology, that the nodes show a direction in life, that's true. It's just the way that that direction is shown, and specifically how K2... Uh, is important in this process is different um, from how it's stated in evolutionary astrology. Okay, second person of the three people who have Saturn conjunct K2 with the smallest orb and the birth time is not on the quarter hour and we do have a lot of biography is actor Anthony Edwards. Let's look at his chart. Saturn conjunct K2 with a two minute orb. And again, if you didn't watch the earlier videos in the series, this is what's called the true node. In case you're K2, if you run this chart and you get a different Rahu and K2, you're probably using the mean node. Two minute orb, Saturn conjunct K2. Does Anthony Edwards also have this um, tone, this, this disposition of not being inclined to what's superficial, what's glamorous, holding to some simple fundamental principles behind whatever he does. And he, his Rahu's in the first house, Rahu in the first house makes for a strong, a need to be, to be a strong presence in Leo to express himself as a strong individual, which he does through the acting. Um, but bringing the wisdom of uh, Saturn on his K2 in Aquarius in the seventh house, but that Saturn sitting right on K2 two minutes is extremely strong, stronger than the sign of the house. That planet right there, very unique, very powerful. He is a Saturn K2 person, just like George Archer. Now, let's look at uh, the different ways of looking at it. Does he have ancestral limitations to overcome uh, using an evolutionary astrology viewpoint? Here's a quote. Edward stated that producer and screenwriter Gary Goddard had befriended him for years, sexually assaulted his friends, including Edwards, when they were 12 years old. Well, there's a really awful thing that he's born into. I mean, he's only 12 years old, so... He doesn't have a lot of choice about this. Um, by the way, calling it karmic almost puts blame on Edwards. I have a lot of problems with that. Um, if that's what you want to say about this, I'm not so sure that that's really true or helpful. Um, but maybe it is true. I don't know. But And again, we have the same problem we have with, uh, with George Archer. Why is it specifically this limitation for George Archer? It was um, being illiterate, in this case, sexual abuse. Um, 
if we're so broad and, and allowing for so many things, can you look at the ruling sign and have to make, draw that conclusively? Or can evolutionary astrology even do that? Is this so divorced from our manifest lives that we don't see it? Um, so I would say, you know, again, similar to the first chart we looked at, um, you could kind of make sense of it. You can see something, but not crystal clear. Is there a deep, reclusive, high spirituality and perhaps loneliness? Nothing that I can see from the biographies. Was there selective and limited in his friends? That's not so obvious either. And anyway, was his life, or you might conclude that it is. I mean, you can look at the biography, you can interpret it. If you're, um, you know, using your system of astrology, but I, I'm just... Um, doing the best one person can with, with with these very subjective evaluations, and I think it's pretty fair to say these things are not conspicuous. Is his life infused? Is in, is infusing his life path with sincerity, depth, and long range view? Uh, what's really important? So, here are some quotes, um, and I have highlighted here in bold. Below are quotes that exhibit these qualities in his work. So these are quotes. Here's the website that I got these quotes from. Well, Anthony Edwards said, there's really no point in having children if you're not going to be home enough to father them. Whoa, that's a Saturn South Node thing. Um, he comes into this life with a sense of what really matters, the real fundamentals. Um, if you're not going to be home to father your children, there's no point in it. The simplicity, the directness, the, you, you know, no prevaricating about this. This is Saturn. This is it, man. You know, uh, he was at, he, in an interview, he was talking about one of the movies he was involved in called Pet Cemetery 2. He said it's probably the most important movie I've ever worked on because the, it's the movie I met my wife on. So, um, this is a Saturn K2 tendency <clears throat> to focus on what really matters. Not, um, you're interviewing somebody and they're always talking about what, you know, was the biggest hit, what was the most exciting. This is where he met, he's talking about his children, his wife. Um, here's another quote from the same website page. It was unbelievable, the, unbelievable the amount of work that had gone into the creating of that movie. It was amazing to see the detailed dedication of a filmmaker. Obviously, David Fincher is one of the great American filmmakers. So it's a tendency of Saturn South Node to constantly see what really counts, what the real work is, what's really meaningful, not the publicity, the pizzazz, and whatever. About another movie called Downtown, he said, it was so overcomplicated in the shooting of it. It was such a simple, funny story, but it got so overshot that all the freshness of it got taken out of it. So I think as a result, it ended up being not such a great movie. Very much Saturn in some way overcomplicated the shooting of it, trying to make too much out of it. This Saturn South Node bringing in the sense that we've come here this Rahu K2. Rahu, we've come here to do something. Okay, I'm an actor. I've come here to do this. I'm doing my thing. And it needs to come from a place of sincerity, of honesty, of being real. And it had a simple, it was a simple, funny story. It had a good idea to it. Simple, Saturn. It was direct, it was funny, it was good, and they overdid it. That movie broke his source of Saturn conjunct K2. Now, am I making too much out of this? You can go to his website page. You can see other quotes that I didn't, didn't use. Maybe. I don't think the nodes... Well, let me say that this way. So far, Rahu and K2 are not manifesting in as clear, sharp, a way as connections between planets. But it does appear to be consistent with the meaning of 
Rahu and Ketu that I gave. It is consistent with the vibrational astrology meaning. And the third case, I think, is the one that fits the best. Issa Rae, writer, actress, producer. Uh, I'll tell you about her on the next slide, but, um, well, let me tell you this. She um, made these YouTube presentations, I guess you'd call them movies, um, about oh, misadventures of awkward black girl. So Issa Rae is uh, black. She, her father was in medical practice in Senegal, I think it was, but she grew up in Maryland in the United States. And there's this image of people who have black skin that, you know, they're cool and they're groovy and they can dance and all these stereotypes. And she doesn't fit them. Is this ever a strong Saturn thing in some way? And, and the nodes do have to do with connecting and bringing together. She's coming from Saturn South Node, which means what's really counting here? I, what, why am I here? I, you know, I need to bring in something sincere and honest and simple and not get lost in, in all these games and advertising and promotions and phoniness. And she writes her, her memoir about herself that she's the awkward black girl, misadventures, and she's funny and just tells a simple, like in first person, like this happened, and you have to laugh how people are expecting her to be a certain way. And what's really Saturn, you know, Saturnian about this is she's uh, bringing into question a very popular images that people go along with that you know, these stereotypes. So, uh, are there ancestral limitations to overcome? Yes, she is stereotyped as black, but she does not fit the stereotype. So actually expecting people to be a certain way because of their skin color, she doesn't fit. Um, is, she so, is she deeply reclusive in a high spiritual and perhaps lonely, not in an obvious way? Is she selective and limited in her friends? Yes. Uh, that's what her book and her, and then, you know, she was on a regular, um, I think it was TV show and stuff. Does she infuse life path with sincerity, depth, and a long-range view of what is really important? What, really important? Oh, my God, this is extremely true. This is what she's known for. She breaks popular stereotypes of what black Americans are supposed to be. In a plain and direct way that's also humorous, she shows that the inherited cultural stereotypes do not work. They do not work, and, you know, she doesn't fit these stereotypes. Um, she's more nerdy, and, you know, she just doesn't fit what they're, they're saying. She shows that they do not work. This is Saturn, um, very strong Saturn, and could very well be the Saturn K2. She's coming into this life with this informing her creativity. If you look at her five vibration chart, just like we did for... Franklin D. Roosevelt um, in this series of videos, if we look at her five vibration chart, she has Mercury, Rahu, Vertex, ne Neptune, and Mars all within three degrees, or less than four degrees. Huge. This is similar to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's nine vibe. I think I showed that in the second video in the series. This, this strong momentum, this torrent of energy, for her to make something that's not prosaic, that has imagination, has vision to it, to to communicate this, to follow it, um, and that Saturn K two opposition, the whole thing, showing that what's behind her creativity, her vision, her understanding, and this torrent of creativity. She's a writer. She's a producer. She's She's an actress. She's doing all this. What's behind it? Misadventures of a black girl. <laughs> that all of this fancy stereotypes and pizzazz and whatever, somebody just doesn't fit into it. Uh, they're, they, they, they're, they don't 
it's it's fictitious it's not real it's not her people put labels um, that that just don't work so her sincerity simplicity her distaste for superficiality and game playing as driving motivations behind the themes of her work that's what Saturn on K2 should mean that's exactly her life so in the case of Issa Rae Saturn on K2 bam the vibrational astrology thing works perfectly and does she have the, the Vedic and the evolution? I don't think it's so obvious, I mean, in, in that many ways, um, but that becomes crystal clear. So conclusions. Clear, strong, and unambiguous support for the meaning of Rahu and Ketu has not been achieved to the level that we have confirmed the meanings of vibrations, like 7, 11, and others, the meanings of planets. Um, it seems to be a background theme that informs our lives, it's hard to confirm it so far with um, statistically, but we can confirm it qualitatively that the vibrational astrology meanings that we're proposing for Rahu and Ketu do fit with our qualitative research where we, where we remove selection bias and other problems. And we're looking at these extreme types that must fit. Extreme types must fit or you, you lose confidence in your theory. The only one that fits is... Uh, consistently is the vibrational astrology interpretation of Rahu and Ketu. And I think what this new interpretation does is it simply modifies and refines the meanings as they're given in Vedic and in evolutionary. They don't completely contradict it. They just show some refinements needed to those interpretations. Um, and uh, again, I emphasize here that in, in vibrational astrology, Astrological variables are understood to be energetic for forces. There's not so much emphasis on good and bad. And good and bad creep into this Rahu K2 stuff like crazy. And all we're saying in vibrational astrology is you're coming in informed by K2. Everything has a positive purpose. That informed perspective of K2 should breathe life into what you do. It's not the clear outer expression, but it in, informs the purpose behind it, the, like the value of what you're doing. Okay. Um, oh, and let me just read this last sentence. In vibrational astrology, there's no assumption that there's unresolved karma to fix. You're supposed to utilize that. Okay, so that's it, my friends. That's the meaning of Rahu and Ketu. Um, as we currently understand it and um, given fairly deep uh, deep dive into the other uh, ideas on it so if you're a subscriber thank you if you're not a subscriber if you could just hit click that subscribe button it really 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 helps there's also a membership if you want to interact with me um, live with questions and answers you can become a member I have here on this slide three different ways that you can become a member and there are two levels of membership um, if you want to again have live meetings with me online zoom meetings to, for questions and answers pursue anything you're interested in and uh, the videos of course are free I've made over 700 videos they're all free they're available so subscribing helps me to continue to provide that free service and the memberships are not free, but they're not hugely expensive. Thank you so much for uh, watching these videos and your support. God bless. Namaste.